Hey everybody, welcome to True Crime Paranormal with the Psychic Sister. I'm Christy Brower and I am your host tonight for our Wednesday night case update show. Katie is off watching softball. I'm sure if you have listened to this show for any amount of time, you are not surprised by that at all. But I am here to bring you this week's case updates, which of course will feature mostly the Daybell Vallow case because right now there's a lot going on with that case. But uh, I also have another uh, cold case that's had a an arrest, which I'm pretty excited about that I want to share with you. So feel free if you are here live on YouTube or Facebook to jump into the chat and say hello. I'm excited to have you all here with me tonight. And if you know of any uh, true crime updates that I don't mention, please feel free to share them because, well, it's a big old true crime world out there, my friends. And <laughs> Sometimes we miss stuff because there's just so much to see. Hello, Patsy. Hello, Innocuous. Nice to see you here. So I think let's start with the cold case. So you may be familiar with the Haley Dunn case. Haley Dunn went missing in on December 27th in 2010. And this was a really famous story at the time. She, her mother, Billy Dunn, uh, saw her early that morning, just a couple of days after Christmas. She said she was on her way to work, that she looked into her bedroom and saw it, her in her bed, and that she was home alone, and, she, and mom was going to work a 12-hour shift. Now, Haley's dad lived right across the street. They were Her parents were divorced, but he lived across the street. And so they kind of just, she just kind of went back and forth between their two houses. Uh, but when uh, Billy came home from work 12 hours later, guess what? No Haley. Haley wasn't around. And at the time, Billy's live-in boyfriend... house but the next day no Haley and guess what she never showed up at the friend's house because let's get real there was never a plan to go to a friend's house Sean Adkins has finally been arrested for the murder of Haley Dunn and he is in jail uh awaiting arraignment and all of that his bond he he's had a bond uh, hearing so his bond has been set at two million dollars now things are really weird this case is so weird because the adults in this case have behaved so strangely in the whole situation if you're just joining we're just talking about the arrest made in the haley dunn case where they did finally arrest sean adkins who was mom's boyfriend and who everybody had kind of thought had done it so of course when haley is reported missing the town you know goes crazy and they this is in uh, Texas, and the town goes crazy. They're all looking for this little girl, you know, supporting, helping. Guess who's not out looking for this little girl? Mom, dad, or stepdad. None of them, actually. They all have their own reasons for not helping, but they didn't help, which is a really strange thing. So things, you know, things went really weird here. There were several polygraphs done of mom billy and the boyfriend sean particularly because there'd been some domestic violence incidents between the two of them leading up to this case or lead yeah like leading up to her disappearance and so it they were kind of suspicious the police were kind of suspicious of them anyway so mom had two polygraphs the first they decided was no good because she was under the influence of narcotics while she took it. So they did it again. Second time, she did show some deception. The police have never released what the questions were that she showed deception on, but we do know that she did show deception. So then there's Sean. Sean took three polygraphs because Sean walked out on the first two. And so they couldn't be completed. And on the third, 
he was found to be telling the truth on two questions. So they these were the two questions. Where can we find Haley? He said, somewhere in Scurry County. And then they asked him, who should we be looking at in this? And he said, you should be looking at us. Sean was not arrested at that time. Scurry County is 20 miles north of where Haley was last seen, and it is where Haley's body was found. Her um, skeletal remains were found in 2013, and yet nothing happens for all of this time until now. And I will tell you that we do not know at this point why they have now arrested him or where this came from. But he has been arrested for Haley Dunn's murder. So we're going to keep an eye on this. This is a very famous cold case from, you know, 11 years ago now. And maybe there's going to finally be some closure on this particular case. But it is an interesting one. There's very little explanation out there about when he literally said, this is where you should look for the body and this is who you should be looking into. Why nothing happened then? We don't know. But at least something is happening now. It, you know, everybody in the community, including mom, there were lots of people that really did believe that this was Sean Atkins the whole time. But it's sure taken a long time to get to that. I want to take a moment, welcome you all into the chat, Bianca. <laughs> uh, feel relaxed, be happy, and live well. Okay. Stephanie, Cat, Mouth of the South. Uh, Paula, I think I already said, or was that Patsy? Pa Paula and Patsy, see? Paula, welcome. RJ, Tracy, Cat. Yeah, thanks everybody for being here. So that is the update in the Haley Dunn case. There's finally been um, an arrest 11 years later of the guy that pretty much everybody knows committed the murder and the kidnapping and the murder. So, okay. You know, I know it's kind of one of those, well, duh, why did this take so long? We don't know. And hopefully soon we will understand why this took so long. So let's get to the second update because of course, Mark Means cannot disappoint. We all know this. So we know that Lori Vallow in the Daybell Vallow case, of course, this is the murders of J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan and Tammy Daybell. And Lori Vallow has been found incompetent to stand trial, but repairable, which means that she can go to a hospital and, you know, get spiffed up a bit and then she'll come back and stand trial. That's basically what's happened. So... <laughs> We don't know if she's been transferred to a facility or not yet. We do think it's likely that she will go to the state hospital, which is in Blackfoot, Idaho, which is about 25 miles from where I live. And that's that hospital is called Blackfoot South. We don't know that officially, but it's pretty much all we've got. So pretty sure. So there was a document filed on Friday by means with the court. And <laughs> he made some really bizarre requests as he is known to do. Um, here are some of them. He wants all conversations about Lori's treatment, transfer to the facility and other issues regarding her competency and the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. He also wants Judge Boyce to order private and confidential access to Daybell while she receives treatment. Now she should have the right to that because he is her attorney, but all uh, conversations about transport and all of that, he doesn't have the right to that. Here's the thing. She's been committed to the state for being incompetent. It means she can't even make her own decisions. So they're not going to let him make her decisions for her. That is the Department of Health and Welfare's job. He was also complaining because Lori has been uh, declared indigent, which means that she can't pay for her legal fees anymore. He is a defense attorney that she originally hired. Apparently, he's not been paid for the things that he's been doing since she was being declared in, indigent. I'm sure there is some process that he must go through in order to be 
deemed her public defender and get paid, but I can guarantee you he doesn't know what that process is, nor has he tried. He probably just assumes that money is going to just show up on his doorstep because that's how means rolls. Here's the next one. This part, I mean, we know means is a terrible attorney, but maybe he's also a terrible psychiatrist. He says he wants to be directly involved in Lori's treatment and asks for the names and credentials of all people involved in her care. Doesn't have the right to any of that. He also wants to know proposed treatment medications and plans before they are given to Lori. Yet again, has absolutely no right to ask for any of those things. It's completely ridiculous for him to ask for any of it. She's been committed. Basically, at this point, the Department of Health and Welfare is her legal guardian because she has been found incompetent by the courts. You know what that means? That means that this guy doesn't have any right to say anything about what she does because he's not in charge of her. The Department of Health and Welfare is. Now, they will likely give him access to her because she he is her attorney. But beyond that, as far as treatment is concerned and treatment plans and those kinds of things, they're not going to tell him. They're not going to tell him anything. She can tell him if she chooses to, but they're not going to uh, cater to that at all. Hey, Jacqueline, thanks for joining us. So, yeah, dude needs some serious help. Thank you, Patricia. Yes, he definitely does. Um, so she has been committed for up to 90 days to restore her competency. And basically, as soon as they feel that she can understand her charges and participate in her defense, she's going to go right back to jail and her trial proceedings will continue. This is not as if she has to be 100% mentally healthy before that happens. Not the case at all. She simply has to understand the charges against her and be able to assist in her defense. So it's not like they have to fix her. They don't. They just have to get her lucid enough to be able to understand. They can extend for another 180 days to receive treatment if the 90 days isn't enough. So we'll see what happens here because we know what, what we think is happening is that she is so delusional at this point that she doesn't actually understand the charges. She was definitely not incompetent at the time the crimes were committed. We know that because of all of her attempts to cover her tracks. But at this point, she has become delusional to the po point that she can't understand what's happening. And, you know, she's still in that on that crazy train that, you know, they were zombies and it was okay to kill them. And, you know, my husband's going to save me and he's God and I'm God and all that stuff. So they've got to get her back to reality enough to understand these things. So this is what's happening. So the prosecutor just today responded to, in his words, the inappropriate and absurd requests of Mark Means. This kills me because I just love Rob Wood. He is so smart and so on top of these things and um you know he called me these arguments unfounded and legally unauthorized right because she's committed he doesn't have any power um let's see here's what wood has to say the state sent an email to defense counsel and the court immediately notifying defense counsel and the court of the single phone call with the Department of Health and Welfare. So the prosecutor's office had a phone call with, with the Department of Health and Welfare. Means, you know, flipped his wig over that. Um, the state did not initiate said communication and immediately brought it to the attention of both the court and the defense counsel. The department is an independent agency and therefore equally accessible to defense counsel should he wish. So he could call them and talk to them himself. There was some conversation that happened about how to move her and that kind of stuff that happened through the prosecutor's office. 
The state is unaware of any legal, psychiatric, or medical authority that would allow the court, defense counsel, or the prosecutor, all of whom lack medical degrees, to interfere with the daily treatment of the defendant or dictate how any such treatment should be proceed, Wood wrote. Hilarious, right? <laughs> because we are not medical professionals, you guys. You know, Mark Means thinks he, I just think he's, thinks he's everything, apparently. He's just as delusional as Lori is. Uh, in response to him asking for private and confidential access to Lori, uh, Wood said, while an individual in a treatment facility can often contact their attorney, defense counsel's unrestricted request is not supported by law. So he wants unrestricted access to her. He's been trying to get that in jail too, because for some reason they're not supposed to follow the rules for her. She can have whatever she wants. Remember when they tried, he tried to get him to let her have a cell phone. No, she has to follow whatever the rules are. And there will be limits about her when, when she can make phone calls and how long they can be and visits and all that kind of stuff. Um, that will be set by the hospital, just like they're set by the jail. Um, <laughs> the defense attorney also requested that Daybell have no communication with anyone while in treatment without means permission in order to prevent self-incrimination. Wood says this request is absurd as it is because it would be up to the hospital to determine who she could have contact with and what was deemed appropriate for her for her mental health and certainly not up to her attorney. Uh, this last statement by Wood just, yeah. This is simply another inappropriate attempt by defense counsel to dictate the department how to perform the task the defense counsel requested and the court ordered. Remember that this all came from Mark Means to begin with. Defense counsel injecting himself into the daily treatment and work of the defendant by medical and psychiatric treatment providers is highly improper and not allowed under the law. So there you have it, Mark Means, you jackass. So they are not going to be allowing him to run the show as usual. It turns out that they do, in fact, have to follow all the rules, just like everybody else. Lori is not special. Mark is not special. And if they thought this hospitalization was some kind of way out of this, it is definitely not because she is considered repairable, which means they can fix her at the hospital and send her back to jail. She's still going to stand trial for the first degree murder of her children and for conspiracy to commit first degree murder for Chad's wife, Tammy. That's going to happen. Whether it happens now or next year or whenever, whenever she, you know, wakes up to reality, that's when it is going to happen. And no matter what they try to do to change that, it's not going to work. Uh, Kat says, means is emotionally exhausting and annoying. Him and Lori are just so very toxic together. It's true. And, and it, he acts like he must not have any other clients. Like he's focused so heavily on her. He is sleazy. He's a sleazy, lazy bum and should be disbarred for his behavior. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree with you, Kat. You don't have to apologize. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Laura says, or Paula says, I think he has to provide exact itemized statements of any and all expenses he wants reimbursed. Those expenses would have to be approved before they are paid. <laughs> Do you think he has an accountant? No, I don't. And I'll bet you 10 bucks he hasn't filed any of the right forms to get paid because we have seen this happen over and over and over again with him. He just thinks things are supposed to magically happen for him and Miss Lori. And I'm sure that there's a whole paperwork process that he has to go through and bill for the things that he's done and make sure that they are approved and right. But he hasn't done any of those things. I don't know how he just assumed money was going to arrive to him. But yet again, Mr. Means has proven to us what a jackass he is. Um, but once Lori is hospitalized, we will hear nothing about her because she has HIPAA rights in the hospital. They will be releasing no information whatsoever unless it's to the court. And when they release information to the court, it will be progress reports. And we won't hear anything until they say, okay, she is, uh, you know, she is now able to stand trial. And that's what we will hear. We won't hear anything. They're not going to share a thing. 
<laughs> yeah, JR, his career rises and falls behind this case. It does. It absolutely does. So very interesting um, stuff going on here. Really, really happy about the Holly or the Haley Dunn thing. As long as it really sticks this time, it's so strange to me that there's been there has been cell phone ping information years ago that proved that um, Sean was in fact out there. Sean Adkins was out there where um, Haley's body was found. I mean, there's. There's so much, there's a lot of circumstantial stuff around him. And then he himself admitted that in the polygraph. And so I've never understood why he was never, you know, arrested until now. So we don't know what they have on him, but we will keep an eye on that and keep the Haley Dunn case um, in the forefront so that we can see what's going on with that. Hopefully, we get a conviction there and that, you know, the people that love Haley will get at least a little bit of closure. And, you know, we'll keep an eye on this whole uh, Mark Means thing. You know, he may keep filing ridiculous bullshit all while Lori's in jail to keep us busy. But um, the reality is that there is a hearing coming up for Chad Daybell on June 23rd. So he has already pled not guilty to all eight of his charges very serious felonies, first degree murder and and uh, conspiracy to commit first degree murder and insurance fraud. And we um, will be keeping an eye on that. But there is a hearing coming up next week on the 23rd that is a planning meeting to plan his trial, his uh, preliminary and trial. So going to be interesting to see what happens here if we're going to see a plea at some point. Um, I got to say, I'm pretty doubtful that he's going to go to trial. There's so much evidence against against him and he has so little on his side. There's so little defense for him, but it's pretty arrogant. So we don't know, but we will cover that hearing next week and let you know. Um, if you want to uh, suggest a case to us, uh, send it to us through our website and I'll take a look at it. Uh, JR, I don't know offhand about the Cassandra Ramirez case. It sounds familiar, like I've read about it, but I don't have anything to say about it right now, but I will take a look at that. Uh, we have released all of our cases this week. We really appreciate the um, awesome response that we have had to the Oliver Poe Jackson case, because this is a tough one. And it was an important one. We actually have con have had direct contact with friends in this situation, and it is a fairly um, delicate one. And we just want to say that we really appreciate all of you for the respect that you have shown that case, um, because they're not always easy, you know. Uh, we did do What Do Lida Southard and Lori Vallow Have in Common this week. If you haven't looked at that, Lida Southard was the first known serial killer in Idaho, and she has some crazy similarities to Lori. Of course, the Oliver Poe Jackson case, which is the Slab City murder, if you want to take a look at that one, if you haven't yet. And who is the Lady of the Dunes? Many of you have asked us to do that case, and we did. So pretty interesting one, an old one that we did a cold read on. So we will be back tomorrow night with, uh, excuse me, the Psychic Hour. That's Thursday at 7 p.m. right here. It's a live stream again on YouTube and Facebook where we will also be sharing it after the fact as well. And we will be back this weekend with some pop-ups. So, you know, we're always around. If you want to suggest a case to us, go to our website, truecrimeparanormalpodcast.com. You can suggest a case there. You can uh, find the link to join our Patreon there. You can get a reading with me or with Katie. You can learn all kinds of things. You can actually listen to or watch all of our shows right there on our website if you want to. We really appreciate all of you for being here with us. And Katie and I will be back together next uh, for our next show tomorrow night. But you know it, you've been listening to True Crime Paranormal. Thanks for being here.